Thank you, ladies. I appreciate these uh, young ladies. They come from a country in which they have lived under a harsh regime that has denied them freedoms. And so they love this country because of the freedoms that they are able to enjoy here. And they're serious about wanting to know and do the will of God. There's a zealousness there, I think, that uh, can be appreciated. Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 16. This is a wonderful chapter, isn't it? What goes on here. I mean, there's some stuff that we can't perhaps uh, relate to, but just to see God at work in an individual life like this is just amazing. Sometimes we get the impression that God's far off, that he's not really aware of what's happening to us or what we're going through, but you get a lot of reassurance when you understand what's happening here in the 16th verse. Have you ever taken a detour, uh, maybe on a trip, road trip, and uh, you live to regret it? <laughs> you found out it was, it was a bad mistake? Well, this chapter, I think, records some of the pain of a detour that brought conflict not only to Abram's home, but to the whole world. In fact, we're still dealing with it today. What happens here in chapter 16, we are still feeling the effects of it today. Isn't that amazing? It's an account of more than ancient history. You want to know the origin of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? You're looking at it. Right here in Genesis chapter 16, believe it or not. And uh, it's, a, it's a good chapter for us who are believers because it really teaches us some valuable lessons. It teaches us, first of all, and I think most importantly, don't ever try to live depending upon your own wisdom Depending upon your weak attempts to please God, it's not going to work. It's like a detour that really messes you up. Don't do it. But rather, we learn the necessity, absolute necessity, the must of looking to God all the time and depending upon His wisdom and His ways in that hour. But we already have seen in reading this passage together this morning is that this takes place when Abram was 85 years old, still able to produce a child. His wife, she had been barren all of her life, and now she was, she's 10 years younger than him, so she's 75. Obviously, she, if she ever was going to have a child, she's well past the childbearing age, right? Remember when we first hooked up with Abram in chapter 12, when God calls him and he leaves his home country and he travels to the land of Canaan, he's 75 years old, so 10 years have gone by, and actually we're told that in this passage. But remember... During that 10 years that he was in Canaan to this point at 85, this is a little loud, this microphone here, is, or this, I, I hear ringing, unless it's my ears. But anyhow, what I was trying to say was that um, during that 10-year period, remember there was a great famine in the land of Canaan? And so they go down to Egypt. Well, when they came back from Egypt, I think they brought not only flocks and herds with them, they were enriched, even more so, Abram, but they brought some maids and, and uh, servants with them, and one of which was this young woman, Hagar. She was an Egyptian, obviously. She was obtained when... They were down in Egypt during that time of famine. So Abram's 75 when God calls him, promises that 
I'm going to give you a seed that is going to be so numerable, it's going to be like looking up at the night sky and uh, the number of stars is just going to, you can't count them, you won't be able to count your descendants. Ten years have gone by since God said that, no son yet, not even the first, let alone an innumerable multitude of, there's none. Why is it taking so long? And Abram at 85, again, while he can still father a child, Sarah's past childbearing age. Why was God doing this? Why is he taking his time, we would say? Why is God not rushing this? You know why? We get the answer in the New Testament. Both in Romans 4 and in Hebrews chapter 11, I think it's verse 12, you know what God says? He is deliberately waiting until... They're both dead as far as reproduction is concerned. So that he can no longer, he's no longer uh, virile. He's no longer able to produce a child. And obviously her womb's dead too. She can't uh, carry a child, right? So God's deliberately waiting until it's a human impossibility. Why does God do that? The main reason is this, and I touched on this. I think Wednesday's sermon was, was just the foundation that's preparatory for understanding chapter 16. God's surprising work. Go back and listen to it if you haven't heard it. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, God waited because that, when it happened, would be a platform for him to display his glory. And if there is anything that human beings need to see, it's the glory of God. Because we're made in the image of God, because we are who we are as God's creatures, he knows that the thing that really works best is when God's people get connected back to him in their human spirit, and that happens when God's glory is revealed to them. When we get a, a sense of God's glory, life becomes transformed. That's why he waited, to give them and us an opportunity to see the glory of God displayed. That ought to be our greatest goal in life. God, I want to see your glory. And if you mean that, then you're not going to push God. You're not going to rush God. You're going to wait on God. You're going to let him show you his glory in the way and at the time that he chooses. In the first four verses, I just want to read, uh, follow with me. I know we read already. Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Yeah, why, why not? Happy wife, happy life, right? Go along with the plan. Sarah's, uh, uh, Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and he gave, uh, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, second wife, as if one's not enough. Second wife. Verse 4, just the first half. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we need to learn the lessons that you have for us from this passage. And I pray that you'll speak to every one of our hearts. What is it you want to say, Lord? Speak it. Just like Samuel, as we've sung. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. May we reflect that in our attitude today. Lord, you know what needs to be heard. There are some that may be listening that they've never been saved. They're lost in their sin. They need to come under conviction and see their need of forgiveness so that they will not be eternally lost in hell. Oh, God. May they say, speak, Lord, I serve you. Those of us that are saved, oh God, we are so like Sarah. Coming up with our own plans, alternative plans when things don't work out the way that we think they should or when they should. 
So, Lord, speak, thy servant hears. All to your glory. We want to see your glory displayed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first word that I would describe what I've just read to you is scheming. Human nature is just, they are master, we're masters at scheming. Scheming. We're natural schemers. We come up with all kinds of things, devise ways to try to make things happen if they don't happen the way that we think they should. And one evidence that we're schemers is we don't want to wait. We are impatient. We want to rush things. We want it to happen now. We are so conditioned, especially in this day, to want instant gratification. What this wife of Abram proposes to him is legally uh, possible. Legally, it's according to the ancient marriage code. They could take a second wife like this. The culture saw that as acceptable. Some cultures still do. But I would say that the world's wisdom is really inherent in that. And uh, when you follow the world's wisdom, even if there is apparent evident success outwardly, don't fall for it. It really isn't what it appears to be. And I would also say this. The only problem with Sarah's plan is it wasn't God's plan. It wasn't the will of God. That's always the problem. In fact, you remember when the, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, is it right for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus says to them, what's written in the law? And they say, well, Moses permitted, uh, permitted uh, the divorcing of a wife. And they go to the scripture there in the Torah. And Jesus says, ah, but you miss, you, you're, you're taking that a little too far. Because when he created male and female, he brought them together. He permitted divorce because of the hardness of your sinful hearts. But it's not God's plan. He brought together man and woman for life. And he said, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so it's not God's will for divorce. And so here is a second wife. Not God's plan. God's plan, go back to Genesis chapter 2. It's very clear. One woman, one man, together, two becoming one forever. Monogamy. That's God's plan. And when you, de uh, when you uh, uh, depart from the plan of God, let me tell you, you open what they call a Pandora's box of problems. So legally, it was okay. Scheming, legally, it's okay. Um, it seemed logical, right? I mean, come on, I'm getting older. Ten years have passed since you promised me. There's not a single son my wife can no longer bear a child even, you know, it's no, not just barrenness anymore. It's menopause has taken over and it's, it's, it's over. So logically, but you know what? Logically, you're usually, you're second guessing God and that's dangerous. They're not being led, uh, she is not being led by God's command. She's being led by her common sense and, and, um, and her desire to have a child by hook or by crook, right? She wants a child. God said she wants it. And I think it's very interesting the way it's, it's worded here as uh, she comes to her husband and uh, proposes this uh, plan to him. And she says in verse 2, that I may obtain children by her. Obtain children. Literally, that I might be built with children. Which rings a bell with me because Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. 
And then he talks about children being the heritage of the Lord, being God's priceless uh, possession that he gives as a reward to godly people. She is not going to let the Lord build her house. She's going to build her house. That's really what she's saying here, that I may obtain children uh, by her. You look at the book of Galatians, and I know it's an allegory that is being, uh, uh, that uh, uh, um, Hagar is, and, uh, is being uh, used as. But in, in Galatians chapter 4, I think verse 22 and 29, in both references to Hagar is that what, sh- what uh, was produced through Hagar was according to the flesh. It was a fleshly move. It was just human. It was the energy of human works, and it doesn't fly with God. It was the result of self-effort. And whenever self-effort gets in the mix, it is completely incompatible with the Spirit of God's work. God doesn't want us messing up His work. And so that's exactly what's happening here. It certainly didn't end up bringing peace to that heart of Sarah, nor did it bring peace to the home. Someone said, in whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed miserably. I've succeeded miserably on occasion. Not only have I failed miserably, but I have succeeded miserably because I've done it in self-effort and I found out that while it worked, it was a mess. So, scheming, legally, logically, scheming. Look at uh, verse 4, the second part of it, Genesis 16, and we continue. And when she saw, that is Hagar, the maid, when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. I had given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. And Abram said to Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. But when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her face. Second word I want to share with you from those verses that I've just read is not scheming, but struggling. There's struggle here, isn't there? Real struggling. When you follow the wisdom of this world, you end up with the warring that comes with the world. I could take you to uh, perhaps James. I don't don't want you to turn there. But perhaps James chapter 3. Listen to this as I read. Who's a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, now was there any of that in Sarah, in Abram, Hagar? If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly sensual, the word in our English version, devilish, demonic. It's demonic wisdom, human wisdom, demonic wisdom. That's what he says here. For where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. That's what God says. And in the next chapter of James, following that kind of wisdom, that source of wisdom, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Was there fightings in this household? Come they not hence even of your lusts, which war in your members, in your body? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. She wanted to obtain a son. You cannot obtain. 
you fight in war and you have not because you ask not. In other words, you don't ask God. You take matters into your own hands. And that you might consume it upon your, your fleshly desires. So, first step, obviously, is get right with God and then get right with others. But what was Sarah's solution? Sarah's solution was, of course, to blame her husband and also to mistreat, to abuse Hagar. I don't know how she abused her, how she mistreated her, but obviously it was bad enough that uh, Hagar fled for her life. Abram's solution was to simply give in to his wife, to abandon his spiritual leadership in the home. Passive husbands are some of the biggest problems that we have in Christian homes today. Husbands that will not stand for what they know the Bible says, what God wants in a home. Let me warn you, big problems. Here is an example of that. He simply gave in to his wife. Do what you think or what you want. It's okay with me. What was Hagar's solution? She refused correction, and her solution was to run to run away. In fact, the root word for her name means to flee. She, her solution was to run from her problems. Does that ring a bell with any of us? To run from her problems. And you know what? Let me tell you, it's impossible to run from your problems because you bring your problems with you because your biggest problem is yourself. We always think uh, the biggest problem is someone else or something else, but it's us. We're the big problem in our lives. And the sooner we realize that, the better off we'll be. The better spiritual shape we'll be in. Whither shalt thou flee from his presence? Where do you think you can go on this earth or in outer space that you can be, you can flee from God? You can't flee from yourself. You can't flee from the Lord. Running away from your problems is a big mistake. Pastors that uh, have problems in their church ministry and then simply leave that church to go on to another ministry and make problems there, big mistake. Big mistake. Don't run from your problems. Face your problems God's way. Get His wisdom. Get His direction. Get his grace to be able to be sustained in the midst of your problems. She ran. Third word, I'll tell you after we read. Verse 7, pick up with me, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her, that is Hagar, the, the runaway maid, found her by a spring, a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And that is deep... Uh, um, Negev or Sinai Peninsula, she's headed home to Egypt. She's going back to mom and dad or wherever. She's headed back home to Egypt. The angel of the Lord finds her there in an oasis by a spring. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, <laughs> yep, calls her by name but tells her what she is. You're Sarah's maid. What are you doing here? Whence comest thou? And whither will you go? Where are you headed? As if God didn't know, right? As if the angel of the Lord was not uh, knowledgeable. But he was confronting her so she would uh, she'd realize what's going on in her life. You're running from your problems. You're running away. And she said, I'm fleeing from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Third word that I want to submit to you is the word submitting. Scheming. What was the second one? Struggling. Struggling. Now submitting. Without submission. Without submission to God, guess what? We cooperate with our spiritual enemies. And I said, running from your problems is, is not the answer because, first of all, you take your biggest problem with you, and that is your sinful flesh that is in you. 
And so if you don't submit to the will of God, then you cooperate with your spiritual enemies. You're the first one being your flesh. The second one, the world. And the third one, the devil. And did you know that that is all there also in James chapter 4? If we would continue to read on in that fourth chapter of James, listen to this. Don't turn, but listen, please. Here's what he says. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity or hostility with God? Whoever, therefore, is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You don't submit to God. You cooperate with your enemy. Your flesh, the world, and go down in this uh, same chapter, uh, verse 6, he says, He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. He gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's the third enemy, the devil. If you don't submit to the will of God, you cooperate with your three spiritual enemies. And that is bad news. And that is so important here. You'll not have peace. You can run from your problems, but you won't have peace. You must submit. Now, I don't know why God told her to return back to the woman that abused her, mistreated her to some, in some, some ways. But it doesn't matter. Because God is the all-wise, all-knowing one. And he must know something that's going to happen in the future that is going to make it all worthwhile. God knows more than... So don't... When I tell you to submit to God in a particular situation, perhaps, that you think it's ludicrous, it's illogical, what you're telling me is you don't believe God. You don't have faith in the Lord. I'm not going to give you the party line of the world's wisdom and the world's thinking. I'm going to tell you what God says. And God says, submit and trust me, and I'm going to see you through. I'm going to work it out, and you're going to see my glory displayed. And if you do it your way, if you run like Hagar, you'll never see the glory of God displayed in your life. Neither will anyone else that might, uh, that might be impacted by the glory of God that he reveals in your life. This is the first time, by the way, verse 7, the first time in the Bible that the angel of the Lord appears. And the angel of the Lord is invariably God in some kind of human form. And in this passage, she calls him God. She says, I've seen God. The angel of the Lord is God in human form. Why do we think it's so strange that God could come in human form in the person of Jesus the Messiah? He's been doing it all along. Read your Bible. And so God appears in human form as the angel of the Lord to this runaway slave girl. And he does that in the Bible. He appears at special times to do special things and here he graciously and tenderly, he gives a command to this young woman to submit to her mistress and uh, to just hope in her obedience to his command that God's going to do something. Well, look with me in verse 11. The angel of the Lord said unto her, you're with child. Yes. Well, you're going to bear a son. Oh. No ultrasound. You're going to bear a son. And when you bear a son, I want you to name him Ishmael. Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. That's a play on words. Ishmael means he, or God, hears. God hears. By the way, God was saying, I have personally heard your cry. You've been abused? I've heard your cry. Name your son God hears. Let that son's name ever remind you that I've heard your cry. Let that son's name remind uh, Abram and Sarah, 
I've heard God hears. And by the way, let me tell you about the kind of son you're going to have. Besides his name, verse uh, 12, he'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Literally, he will be a wild donkey of a man. Now, if you don't know anything about the wild donkeys uh, in the Middle East, then this probably doesn't have much meaning to you. And I'm not going to go into it, but I would simply say that the wild donkeys, they just roam and run uncontrollably. They live like they want to live and where they want to live. He's going to be a wild donkey of a man with uncontrolled freedom. He's going to be a constant uh, uh, hostile aggressor. Even in the matter of his dwelling, he's going to be a constant hostile aggressor. He's going to be disputing with you about land, this son. By the way, need I say that Ishmael is the father of the Arabs, who, of course, are brothers with the Jews. Interesting. That's why I said this passage is really the roots of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict right here. goes back to Genesis 16, verse 12, and what the angel of the Lord tells Hagar. He's going to be an aggressor. Look at verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seeth me. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Thou God seeth me. She called the name of the Lord in Hebrew El Roy. Here's a woman that felt abandoned. But what she has come to realize in this encounter that she has with the Lord is that God knew all along. He heard her in her affliction when she was being abused by her mistress, Sarah. God heard her cry. God saw her affliction. Thou, God, seest me, El Roy. She named him. Though she felt abandoned by God, she came to realize, you know what? God cares. And he has cared all along. He is the God that sees me. And the explanation of what she meant by naming God that is seen in her, her astonished question in the second half of verse 13. Basically, she says, Have I indeed been permitted to see him who sees me? It's an expression of surprise at the real privilege that she has had to see the God that sees her. She saw God in a human form, this angel of the Lord. Have I been permitted to see the God that always sees me? You know, on the uh, back of a $1 bill, there's that pyramid, and over the top of the pyramid, there's an, an eye with, with rays emanating out from it in all directions. The all-seeing eye, and there's, a, there's um, uh, Latin words over it. But basically, what that represents is the eye of God's providence favoring the United States of America. That's what that symbolism represents. Now, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories about what, what it represents. It is the providential eye. God sees. God sees, and because God sees, God works. And God gives favor. He's given favor to this nation. God sees, and he gives favor to Hagar, this abused woman. And she's overwhelmed. She's totally surprised. What a rare privilege I have. 
to see the very one that always sees me. And uh, it's a revelation of the true God who hears me and who sees me. And he spoke to me and he intervened to deliver me. It's an encounter with the living God. It's a relationship that she forms with him at that moment. And it changes this woman's life, I believe. I would say this, no matter what you've faced or no matter what you are going through or will face, God is not blind. God sees and God hears. And because God hears and God sees, we can then derive that he cares. He cares. She named this spring where she was in that oasis in verse 14. Wherefore the well was called Be'er the High Roy. Be, 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 uh, behold, it is between Kaddish and, and uh, Baran. And Hagar then bears the son and so forth. That name that she gives to that, uh, that oasis, that spring, the well of the living one, my seer. Capital S, seer. You know what a seer is in the Old Testament? A prophet. The prophets were called seers because they were able to see God revealed to them the future. God revealed to them the truth. They were called seers. Here is the seer, the one who sees all, who sees the past, present, and future in human terms in one look. He sees it all. He is the seer. And she names this place where she met with God, she names it, the well of the living one, the seer. Emphasizing that God, that's his constant nature, to see. God hears and God sees my affliction is what she's saying. God spoke in, in direct revelation and she responded, I think, in faith. And the lesson for us all is, trust the word of God. Wait patiently for the fulfillment of God's promises. Because self-effort always messes things up. Always. Because God doesn't need your help. God doesn't need my help. God doesn't need human help to accomplish what he said he's going to do. So don't mess it up through self-effort. And don't fear because God has seen and God has heard. God knows and God cares. I can't ever read this 16th chapter without being reminded. Many, uh, many years ago now, a young woman who I spoke to on the phone came to church one Wednesday night, and she had a little child with her, very small uh, at that point. And she said uh, she came from a remote area of the world, a place called Kalash in the mountains of Pakistan on the border of Afghanistan and how that she was in an arranged marriage and was married to a Muslim man who abused her, her and his family abused her and she was even tortured and as a result she took her infant son when she had a chance and she fled and she not only fled the country, she fled and came here to America. And she was here just a frightened uh, young woman and mother with, a, with an infant. And I remember we had a room back there. My wife and I sat in that room and we dealt with her and gave her the gospel. And I remember turning to Genesis 16 and it said, Lakshan, I want to tell you, your story reminds me of a woman that uh, God cared about. He sees and he hears, and I shared the story that I'm sharing with you here this morning with Hagar, the runaway maid. Here's this woman. She ran away. I wanted her to meet God so badly. I wanted her, I wanted God to intervene in her heart and life, and she was open to it, but as far as I know today, she still has not trusted Christ as her personal Savior. But I really feel that like she was a modern-day Hagar, running, and God was hearing her, caring for her, 
listening to her, seeing her plight, wanting to bring her into his embrace. Because God cares. And God's grace is greater than all of our sin. What a mess, huh? But God's grace is greater than all of our sin. And he, he can accomplish the best even when we do our worst. In grace, God saw Hagar running and he intervened by coming to her and speaking to her and meeting her needs. You know why? It all can be traced back to a promise, a covenant that God made with Abraham. Not only God hearing and seeing and intervening in her life, but everything that is connected with you and I and God and his care and his salvation can be directly traced back to Abraham and the covenant that God made with him. It all harkens back to that. Because through him, all the nations of the world are going to be the recipients of the blessings of God if they want it. Abram was going to be the vehicle of God's grace, and he is the vehicle of the grace of God that has been brought to you. From a human standpoint, detours out of the will of God are unsalvageable, but God overrules, and God gets his purpose done despite it all. Satan, he would want us to think at certain points points in our life when we mess up really bad that there's no hope, give up, hang it up, it's all over. But God cares. God hears, God sees, and God intervenes, and he will forgive, and he will cleanse, and he will give you another chance, and another chance. God will never fail you, no matter how many times you fail him. He'll never fail Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for this, the tender way in which you cared for this woman. And Lord, there's a lot of single women in this congregation, and may they have that sense that you hear, that you see, that you care, that even though it seems as if you you're distant, and you have not intervened in their situation. The time's coming. You're there anyway, but you're going to show up, and they are going to see your glory in a way that they would never have expected. As she said in her astonishment, I have seen the God that sees me. Oh, Lord. I pray that every single person that hears my voice would have that kind of an encounter where they would come, in a sense, face to face with you, the living God, the God who sees, the living God, the seer, and come into a saving relationship with you, submit to you, as Hagar was said, Go back, submit to your mistress, Sarah. Submit to your will for our lives and see you work in a glorious way. So save any lost. And Lord, renew and restore your people who've been on the run. Bring them back in Jesus' name. Amen.